Our current tester, Chris Kestius, is checking out the newest and smallest Opal, the Opal Carl. It's just 3.8 meters long, but still sports five doors. He'll show us what it can do. With its compact dimensions, the Carl was made for city driving, for instance, the narrow streets here in Amsterdam. Alongside the Corsa and the Atom, it's the third compact in Opel's lineup. In terms of size, the Carl has space for four to five people and bridges the gap between the tiny Atom and the Corsa. And its price stacks up well against the competition, too. The interior is also impressive. Optional extras offer a touch of luxury, including a touch screen and heated steering wheel. The front seats are the most comfortable, but even the back seats offer enough room for anyone under about 1 meters 80. The trunk expands from 206 liters to about 1,000 liters, but you may have to move the front seats forward to flip down the back seats. Chris says the interior is solid, the instruments are easy to operate, and the workmanship is good, too. In terms of connectivity, Opel has taken it up a notch. Jörg Hedrich van Opel says the car is now compatible with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's all plug-and-play, so operation is a snap. Just connect the smartphone using a USB cable, and within seconds you can access your navigation app. But the IntelliLink radio won't be available till this fall. Once you've import your destination, you want to get there as economically as possible, of course. Opel wanted to keep a lid on costs. That's why the three-cylinder engine doesn't have turbo. But even without it, output is 55 kilowatts. Chris says the Opel Carl is no race car. It's designed for ordinary city and highway driving, and for that, it's more than respectable. With no turbocharger, though, acceleration does take a bit of a hit. In fifth gear, the Carl takes almost 23 seconds to go from 80 to 120 kilometers an hour. Even though the Carl is intended to be the more practical cousin to the Atom, it's no slouch when it comes to style. The exterior sports smooth contours, packing a clean and classic look into a car that's just a hair under 1 meters 90 wide. Chris says the Opel Carl is a contender in the compact segment. For one, the price is right. The base model in Germany sells for under 10,000 euros, and the Carl features some new technology, too. Extras such as heated door mirrors, lane assist, and cruise control will raise the price. But here in Germany, just over 15,000 euros will get you a Carl with all the extras. One Porsche Drive is the leading address of the luxury German car maker in North America. Porsche has spent $100 million to transform an old Ford assembly plant into an automotive palace. It's Porsche's largest ever investment outside Germany. The Experience Center Atlanta offers a classic car exhibition, driving simulators, a performance center, and a 1,200-square-meter business center for conferences and events. Our car tester Reinhold Deisenhofer asks, why spend $100 million? The ultra-rich can play the stock market, buy a yacht or plane, or build a racing test track. But now people can test out the capabilities of the SUV, or sports car, off the regular road. And it brings people one step closer to buying a car, of course. The grand opening of one Porsche drive attracted journalists from all over the world. Bravo, cheers. Cheers. Porsche. Take it, Porsche. Porsche.
The car maker expects its new North American headquarters to attract 30,000 visitors a year. Supervisory Board Chairman Wolfgang Porsche was also there. Porsche said that he was involved and it was a real challenge. It was supposed to look nice, but not too expensive. Look nice, it does, as anyone who has enjoyed the 2.6 kilometer test track can attest. Those who have can hardly wait to get back on it. Einhold says driving instruction is always a good idea. You don't just want to be fast, but safe too. That starts with things like proper sitting position and emergency braking techniques. At the same time, people should have fun. That's why Daimler are also building a test center in Atlanta. It's got the busiest airport in the entire U.S., which makes it easily accessible from across the country. Of course, the 20,500 square meter grounds wouldn't be complete without an off-road park. If classic Porsches are built for tight curves, SUVs like the Cayenne and the Macan are designed for rough terrain. Reinhold tells us that most SUV owners are proud of their vehicles, and it would be embarrassing if they lost their nerve off-road. Here, they can practice, so they look good going up and down mountains. And one Porsche drive is hardly the end of the Porsche experience centers. The car maker plans to build similar corporation attractions in other parts of the world. Porsche chief executive Matthias Müller says the car maker is building a driving experience center in Shanghai and plans further ones in Moscow and Istanbul. Another in Le Mans will incorporate the famous track. Müller says Porsche hopes to offer customers something special. But for now, one Porsche drive is the car maker's premier bid to make Porsche more accessible to people around the world. After three years, the Peugeot 208 is getting a well-deserved facelift. Now the 208 GTI will be sold exclusively in the 153 kilowatt version. Both the 208 GTI and the 208 GTI by Peugeot Sport now feature the mirror screen function standard, where smartphone apps can be displayed on the car's 7-inch touchscreen and managed using vehicle controls. And BMW has finally unveiled its new 7 Series flagship. The luxury sedan aims to set a new standard in lightweight construction, engine power, chassis and operation, as well as intelligent connectivity and interior ambience. The executive lounge rear seats even feature a massage function. Our car tester Ines Petri tells us that Volkswagen has expanded the Golf family to include a new efficient engine. It's called Blue Motion, a designation that's already been used for diesel and natural gas engines. Now there's a one liter gasoline engine, so let's see what it can do. What's under the hood? The three cylinder 85 kilowatt motor isn't completely new. It's already used in the VW Polo and VW Caddy. But in comparison to its predecessor, the 1.2 liter TSI, it's around 10 kilos lighter. The primary purpose is efficiency. VW says the vehicle uses only 4.3 liters per 100 kilometers. That yields CO2 emissions of 99 grams per kilometer. Ina says out on the road, you notice the small engine. You have to step on the gas to get up to speed. But at 2,000 RPM, the TSI Golf Blue Motion has a maximum torque of 200 newton meters and a top speed of 204 kilometers per hour. Plenty of power for passing. Sport 
Besondere. Also Volkswagen's Wolfgang Dimmelbauer Ebner says lots of things, rather than any one element, are special about this engine. For example, the cylinder head with an integrated exhaust manifold. The exhaust goes directly to the turbocharger. It's cool before it gets there. The design allows the engine to manage heat better. That reduces friction inside the engine and also gets it up to running temperature more quickly. That helps save fuel, especially on short trips. Let's look back at the history of the GTI. It was introduced to the market in 1976 as the sporty member of the Golf family. It got its speed from a 1.6 liter four-cylinder engine. 40 years later, the engine is much smaller, but it's actually more powerful. Dimmelbauer Ebner says that the original GTI was a dream car when he was young, the epitome of the roadster. This new engine offers better performance, and it's sensationally efficient. Every new engine version has featured new features. It was a long evolutionary process from the original GTI engine to now. Ina says the car comes with a standard six-gear transmission, but the car we tested was the seven-gear model, which costs 1,875 euros more in Germany. The extra investment is well worth it, though. It gives drivers the option of driving the car in the normal energy-efficient or in the sports mode. The latter revs higher and makes the car faster. The TSI Blue Motion may look like a regular Golf at first glance, but there are a lot of distinguishing technical details, such as the upper radiator grill, which is almost completely enclosed. Behind the lower air intake, there are adjustable fins that optimize the aerodynamics and temperature. The brake cooling channel is completely enclosed, which directs air around the vehicle. Also increasing efficiency are the super low friction tires and a chassis that has been lowered by 15 millimeters. Ina says whether the car manages 4.3 liters in everyday conditions depends on how it's driven, but Volkswagen's new engine is a positive development for conventional engines. And the car maker says there's more where that came from. Our car tester Sasha Knapp is about to put a Mercedes C-Class through its paces. Not this vintage model, but the new one. But we do have time for a comparison of old and new. The 202 was the first car to be called a Mercedes-Benz C-Class. Since 1993, the C-Class has been Mercedes' smallest rear-wheel drive model and a mid-range flagship. The car was available in a variety of designs and with a variety of option packages. We're testing the smallest package, the Esprit. Sasha says that as soon as he got in the car, he noticed how much room there was. But he says that may be because the seats are wider and have less side support, giving an impression of space. Dass man hier den Eindruck hat, dass man mehr Platz hat. We try out the 1996 C180 with a 90 kilowatt four-cylinder engine. It goes from zero to 100 in 12 seconds, which is pretty slow for such a powerful engine. Back then, the car cost 44,620 marks. Sasha says the car doesn't drive badly, but it does ask a lot more of the driver than modern cars. This vehicle will qualify as a young timer in seven years. Sasha says the new C-Class is a lot more comfortable. The seats are more accommodating, offer better side support, and are electronically adjustable. And that may be a problem. The car has a lot of electronics, including the entertainment system, which is operated by this wheel, along with touch pads and various buttons. 
In 20 years, when this car is a young timer, it's hard to imagine that everything will still work properly. The new Mercedes C-Class has an individually adjustable air ride system, a novelty in this category. To improve drivability, Mercedes engineers put the C-Class on a diet. The hood, the hatchback, and the roof are all made of aluminum. Sasha says that the steering wheel is noticeably smaller and more practical, and the chassis is a lot better. The new C-Class reacts immediately, whereas the old one was a bit of a boat. The lightweight materials and the best drag coefficient in its class make the car very fuel efficient. The 150 kilowatt C250 Bluetech diesel model we tested consumes only 4.3 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. Carbon dioxide emissions are low, 109 grams per kilometer, and the car is a top speed of 247 kilometers an hour. The car we tested with the avant-garde option package costs a bit over 46,000 euros in Germany. Sasha says functions like automatic trunks weren't around back in 1996. With full hands, opening the back of an old C-Class was tricky, but the trunk itself hardly changed. The old C-Class had a 430 liter capacity, and the new one has just 50 liters more. Separate back seats were optional in the old C-Class, whereas they're standard in the new one. A few things have changed. The old C-Class had a classic grille, while the new one has a 3D grille with a large Mercedes star. But the traditional star in the hood is gone. The two cars' hatchbacks are very different, but the characteristic ornamental molding has been retained. You can still sense a lot of history in the design of the new C-Class. The interior of the old C-Class was somewhat cold and sterile. The new one is more inviting with its high quality materials and bright colors. The gear shift has been replaced by a multimedia console. And the air vent switch has given way to climate control. The old speedometer was very easy to read. In the new model, the onboard computer does the job. Sasha says that for him, it's no contest between the 1996 and 2014 C-Class. Even the interior of the old car wasn't really his thing, so he prefers the new generation. The question is whether you can afford a new car or whether you have to settle for a good used one. In any case, he's going to enjoy taking the new model out for a drive. Ich in meinem Fall drehe auf jeden Fall noch eine Runde in dem neuen. Plenty of friendly faces and 188 vintage cars. The mood is welcoming here at the 28th Alpine Rally in Kitzbühel. But this year, the participants will have to keep their wits about them. Because two rather dangerous looking wise guys are sitting in this Citroen 11B. Gangsters from the look of it. One is Wolfgang Kast. He says matching the outfit of the car is half the fun, and the fans love it. It is all in good fun, and the weapon is a water pistol. They've got 600 kilometers ahead of them, so there's no time to waste. The youngster this year is the Polo G40, with Austrian singer Christina Stürmer as co-pilot. Christina says their car may be newer, but they'll admire all the vintage models as they pass them on the road. Ferdinand Stuck is at the helm of the Polo. Race car driver Hans Joachim Stuck is his father. There's a family rivalry in the making. Ferdinand says they're quite a bit in front of his father. They'll try to hold their position and beat him to the finish. For some of the vintage cars, the steep inclines are a challenge. 
The Polo, though, can put out 85 kilowatts. Even so, the name of the game is join the line and go with the flow. But the oldsters still have a bit of oomph left in them. Look at her go. Sebastian Auger is also here in a Salzburg Rally Beetle for a star turn. Maybe my genetic of a racing driver is going to come back and then I will want to have some adrenaline, of course, like always. I would just close my eyes. <laughs> but remember. And indeed, at the next challenge stage, Sebastian Ogier can't hold back. His racing instincts surge to the fore. With some fancy driving, the Beetle shows what it's made of. But is it really a good idea to take a rare Salzburg Beetle? Or a million euro gem like this 300 SL and push them this hard on the rally course? Shouldn't they just be at home resting? Not at all, says the driver. A car like this needs to get out, and you can wave at everyone. In the meantime, the father-son duel is heating up. Hans Joachim Stuck is in a red Porsche 365B, hot on the heels of his son up ahead. By the midday break, he's caught up, and they pose for a family photo. Ferdinand says they're still planning on beating his father to the finish. His father fell behind on purpose, but they're not going to let him spy on them. Christina says they'll put the rubber to the road. Hans Joachim Stuck says he won't go easy on them. Fadnan and Christina are doing great, but now comes the slalom, where he'll clean up. The slalom is one of the special challenges at the rally. It's an extra, and everyone competes in the same car, a modern Polo GTI. Hans Joachim Stuck may be retired from racing, but he hasn't lost a trick. His co-pilot is most definitely impressed. Oh, wow. Back in his trusty Porsche, he continues onward at a comfortable pace and basks in the beautiful scenery. So it's no surprise that the Polo G40 arrives ahead of him at the finish. Christina says it's all a matter of strategy. Of course, there's always the moment where you think, oh my God, what does this all mean? But once you figure it out, you give yourself a big pat on the shoulder. And then there's the view. They saw it all, even a cow on the road. And Fadnan says they achieved their goal ahead of his father at the finish and on points. Eventually, the Porsche also arrives at the finish line in Kitzbühel. The fans are here too, for one last look. <laughs> Axel Marx says it was lovely, the weather and the course were fabulous. And what's the best part of the Kitzbühel Alpine Rally? When he gets his driver lost, that's amusing. <laughs> he says the best part is watching the fans enjoy themselves. <laughs> Stefan Wittgen says the drive itself is fun, and when you do well on points, that's nice. And then there's the Alpine panorama. And what's great, they didn't even argue. <laughs> Andreas Pohl says it's the classic cars, the landscape, the sense of history. It's all perfect. 